Hello, I'm Aaron Gemmel, and welcome to a special edition of the Hot Seat Sports Talk, which welcome our first entertainer ever, uh, Miss Carrie Louise. She was on Last Comic Standing, uh, a View, and a few other shows she's made an appearance on. She is also married to famous comedian Tom Cotter, famous runner-up from America's Got Talent. So let's get the opening credits rolling, and let's get this show going. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being our first entertainer. Uh, to start off, where, uh, like, where are you from and uh, how did you get started in comedy? Did you get started in comedy at, at a young age, like in high school? How did you get started? At- okay, so I'm from Boston, well, a little bit south of Boston, uh, in the suburbs of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, East called Easton. Um, and uh, throughout high school and everything, I was always involved in sports, so I was never really the class clown everybody asks you know you must be the class clown um um, but i am youngest of four so no one paid attention to me and um my two i have an older sister she was six years older so she never paid attention to me and then my two brothers just beat the crap out of me so i think that's why i started you know doing comedy or wanted to be the center of attention because no one gave it to me as it when i was young so okay. and I think that's why I was always into sports because of my two older brothers. So um, so I there was not room for anything else since I was a jock. So and I couldn't get in trouble because if I got in trouble and I was a class clown and I mouthed off and said the jokes that maybe I wanted to, I wouldn't be able to play that day, you know. Or if I got detention, I wouldn't be able to practice. And if you didn't practice, you weren't going to be able to play. So I was always on my best behavior, but on the sports teams and on the field and on the baseball uh, field or the field hockey field because I play field hockey and I also swam and I also um, play basketball so on the court that's where I let out all my that you know that's where I entertain and those those were my audience like kind of in the beginning those kids during stretches I was always the team captain because I always had a funny story or I always made fun of the teacher or whatever that happened that day so I think that's where I got my practice even though I didn't really start young but that's how I that's how I um kind of got started so when I went to college my college was having a contest and I did it I did comedy because I loved comedy so much so I did like comedy and I ended up winning okay um so going back to your sports because you play because like you said you play a lot of basketball you swam field hockey uh, softball, were, were you looked at by any other, like any schools to play collegiate at all? Or uh, was that something you were trying to pursue? Well, I, I, that's the only reason why I went, yeah, that's the only reason why I went to college to play four more years of, of field hockey. And I just, I guess I second guess myself. I always blame my mother. I'm like, mom, why did you push me? Why? I, I could have been somebody. I didn't realize how, how good I was because I was looking for a team that had a, a varsity in college because I really wanted to just, I just wanted to play. So I made sure that there was a vas- varsity team at the colleges that I was looking at because I didn't think I could make, I mean, a, a JV because I didn't think I could make varsity right away. And uh, I, I went to uh, Plymouth University up in New Hampshire. And not only did I make the team, but I made varsity and I played, I started. I'm like, oh, when I made varsity, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna sit on the bench. And then um, I started the first game, and I never, never came out for all four years. Wow, that's that's incre- That's very interesting to hear. Um, and what? and captain two years in college. Wow. And we NCAA champs, uh, NCAA, not and we were Division three, so whatever we were the champs of Division three. Yeah, NCAA Division three. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I made sure that it was a Division three school too because I didn't think I could get in. And you know, my mom didn't push me. Like I could have, I could have been somebody. I mean, it's you're still a national champion in field hockey. I mean, that, that's 
still not a lot of people, not a lot of field hockey players can say that. Uh, what, what did you major in in college? Elementary education. Elementary education. Okay. What was your best memory from college? Uh, uh, winning. I have, I have a few. <laughs> Can I give you my few? Yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, winning the, being the champion, winning the championship. We, we, we won it in a snowstorm, uh, as well. It was like, and I, I remember, I remember walking onto the field and the JV had to shovel our field. <laughs> and I didn't know that they called everybody. They called the JV team at seven in the morning to shovel. I'm like, thank God I didn't make J. Thank God I made varsity. And, uh, we won. I, that was a huge memory. And then when I won the contest, um and, and uh so it was a beauty contest by the way and uh i wasn't i was i was i was a sports girl i had dz shaved in my head i had short short hair at the time i was you know chunky i was a field hockey player um but my sorority was running a beauty contest and they needed contestants and i'm like i'll i'll do it because i wanted to see what comedy i, I loved comedy i wanted to, and you needed a you needed a um a talent. So I did comedy and I won the whole contest. Oh, that's <laughs> it. Wow. Okay. So it was a preliminary for, it was a preliminary for Miss New Hampshire, which I didn't know. Like I knew, I didn't know going in. So the next thing I knew I was in a, the huge, the, the huge pageant, the state pageant, the New Hampshire state pageant representing. Miss New Hampshire. My, wow. Miss New Hampshire. So if I won that, I would have been to, in Atlantic city. For Miss America. For Miss America. I didn't win. Obviously. Like I said, I was oh, fat, overweight. I, I got Miss Congeniality because everybody loved me because I, uh, I wasn't a threat to anybody. So, um, <laughs> and I told jokes. So who wouldn't give me Miss Congeniality? So uh, that's my claim to fame. I well, won Miss Congeniality in the New York, New, New Hampshire State pageant. Well, speaking of your telling jokes, you got your first start on Last Comic Standing. Uh, tell me first off, how do you, how did the first auditions go and what was the process for auditioning for a show of that caliber like? Oh, that's many moons ago, unfortunately. Uh, I got to try to remember what the, uh, so I think I had an audition, like I didn't have to wait around the, the, uh, all day. And you heard all these people camping out, driving down in yeah. New York City the night before where they're, you know, camping out and staying up all night. Uh, so I, I, because people knew me, you know, I was in, I was already established in New York and in, in a lot of clubs. So I had a, 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 an audition set time. So I just went in and uh, uh, just aud auditioned, did my best stuff. You only had like, uh, you know, again, it was, it was almost like that, that contest, the beauty contest. You only had two minutes and 50 seconds to be funny. So I was kind of yeah. used to that. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, that last comic staying was kind of like an American Idol where it's like you don't really, you have like some, some amount of time. Like America's Got Talent, like your husband was on, you only have a certain amount of time to impress in order to move on in those type of contests. Right, so, and it's very difficult, yeah. So when the show, when you got on the show, were you nervous going up on stage and performing? And as you kept advancing in the competition, did it get even tougher like, was there more pressure on you to keep going? Like, t take us through that. Yeah, it's very difficult because, you know, you want to do your best stuff because you want to go forward. But then um, after you do your best stuff, you're like, oh, God, like I should have. Then you're trying to think, well, maybe I should have saved my best stuff for when the competition gets deeper and, and more competitive. Um, so that was what was scary because, you know, I already did my best stuff. So you're just hoping that your second – string stuff is is good enough to carry you through so that was the most nerve-wracking so like is there anything that's off limits for a comedian in a show like that well it was on tv so i think you had to be clean and neat uh i don't think you could you could swear and um you, you know you're trying to win a contest so you don't want to do anything political or else you're gonna you know half the audience and and who knows who's voting for you if you know you don't want to piss them off too and it's 50 50 chance that you that you're going to so you sh in my you know good advice don't do anything political kind of keep it mainstream so <laughs> i guess that would be you know and you don't want to be doing 
anything that might turn them off, like any type of, you know, <laughs> rape jokes, even if it's really funny, because it is on TV. So, right. yeah. and nowadays, nowadays, we can't say anything. We can't say oh. anything. You know, I think that right. we're going to, we're going backwards in time where we're going to have underground comedy clubs, especially when, you know, we, we do get back to work, where the, you know, it's going to be special. It's going to be like, well, they could say anything here, you know? Yeah, yeah. You have to, comedians nowadays are so censored in what they can do. It's not right. like 10 years ago where, you know, you have right. all, these, all these type of comedians just going out saying whatever they felt like. You can't do that nowadays. I know. Uh, and Lenny Bruce and, uh, and uh, George Carlin are rolling in their grave right now going, what did we not, you know, what have we, what have we done? We, we, we brought you... Right. And now you're going backwards. I, I mean, like, I mean, like, to meet rough comedians, like uh, Triumph the Insult Comic Dog, all the stuff that he, all the stuff that he said, he can't do, he can't really do not, now. I mean, he's, he's, he's done some rowdy stuff along with a lot of other comedians in your field. So after your appearance on Last Comic Standing, did you hire an agent and did, did you, did your bookings for uh, shows and tours increase? Yeah, I had a manager. I had a manager and uh, it, uh, I moved to, because I had just given birth to my, uh, my twins when I got the show. In fact, I did the, the show that sold the show before I was pregnant. I, it was called, um, I, I, it was called Comic House at the time and it was the same, it was the same setup. And I think that's why I couldn't do the first season. I had to do the second season because I already did the, the pilot for it. And then plus I was pregnant. So, um, uh, so when I, 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 right after I went right to LA to audition for sitcoms and films and I took my parents so they could be my nannies because I had just <laughs> given, just given birth. They were two yeah. years old actually. So I had just given birth during the first season. So I, I couldn't do it. Plus I knew all the, um, they had to do these activities. They did kind of the same activities as we did in the pilot. So I couldn't do it. So I did the second season. They were about two and then I moved my whole family for like three months to go to LA with my manager agents and went out on auditions, tons of auditions for sitcoms and stuff. Wow. That's it. That's interesting to hear. And plus you, you, you also mentioned uh, you're on tough crowd uh, with Colin Quinn, 2003. Describe on what was it like being on that show alongside with like Howie Mandel and those type of comedians? Yeah, I was on that show. They were all bald, by the way. I remember that joke, like, <laughs> uh, um, and it was, it was nerve wracking because, um and i had, it was just it was it was nerve-wracking um who who's the who's the host it was a long time ago i can't even remember and i dated him that's what that was so nerve-wracking too i can't i colin quinn Colin Quinn. so it was him and a bunch of guys and me and i had dated colin quinn too so that was kind of nerve-wracking but still it was really fun and they were all bald so uh um, he, I, I, I hope I can, is this a, a clean show? To, am I going to get in trouble? Oh, go, go for it. So, uh, he said, Hey, Carrie, something like, Hey, Carrie, um, you know, we're the only ones with hair. And, and, um, and I, it was right off the bat and it wasn't cause it was kind of scripted. So, and, and, and so it was right off the bat and I was so nervous, but, and I'm like, yeah, and I kind of looked stone-faced, but then afterwards I had so many re remarks that I could have said, and I so wanted to say, <laughs> I wanted to say, well, well, yeah, they're all bald, but I am too. You're just not here. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, in front of all these guys, I should have said that it would have been very well, funny, but and I, it, was, I was kind of struck and nervous and didn't say anything. And just and how funny it was, you know, you're on a show with all those guys like Howie Mandel and truth be all cut many years down the line, he would be judging your husband in America's Got Talent, which is, know. that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty cool. So you also, you're, like, like I just said, you're on Tough Crowd and then you're, uh, then you went on The View, you made an appearance on The View. What was it like performing on a bigger stage on TV like that on The View? And did you always want to go and perform on a show like that? Yeah, I um, did the warm up for the View, so I would I would warm up for um, uh, you know Barbara Barbara Walters. I she would come and I would have to inter oh, wow. interview her. That was really nerve wracking, and um, it was time sensitive too because you only had a 
certain amount of time to warm up the crowd and then introduce the people and then it's live. So right then and there, that puts such a restraint on you right there. Uh, so that was nerve wracking. And then you, uh, I did, um, I did America's Got Talent. I, I auditioned for them and um, it was right after my husband won it. And um, Howie Mandel says, we know you. How do we know you? And I'm like, my husband won almost won and i'm here to to win the whole thing and i'm like and behind every funny man is an even funnier woman and um so he's an eight yeah, i just i didn't have to wait in line for that i just went to the live shows with and so I'm, i that was when it was in uh radio city music hall so that yeah. was the biggest one of the biggest stage i performed in front of it was radio city music hall it was huge theater it was with Howie Mandel and uh Howard Stern and Mel B and everybody liked me but Mel B so Mel B is like well um I liked you for a minute and then one minute I didn't and I'm like well I'm only up here for 90 seconds so and, and then everybody started laughing go pull her through pull her through like the whole crowd <laughs> and I was like freaking amazing and they pulled me through and I'm all ready to go to Vegas I'm all packed this is how things work this is how the, these shows work they always accept way more than they can so they can manipulate and you never know what's gonna yeah. happen or someone's gonna um, bow out and get nervous so they always have to protect themselves because it's huge it's TV and there's a lot invested so um, I'm all packed up I think it's like the day before I was going to Vegas they called and said we went a different direction Wow, that's... And I don't even have that tape. I mean, it was a killer tape. I don't even have that tape. They won't even give me the tape. Wow, that, that, that's, a, that's unfortunate too, because I really think, because you probably could have won the whole thing just as close as your husband was to winning. Oh. Even, as, even though he lost to a dog act in front of 20 million people. Uh, I know. And, uh, so, and we got a dog after that, so he doesn't yeah. feel that bad. Yeah, so at least he's, good. At least he's not bitter about dogs now anymore. Um, so in a normal year, how many weeks out of the year, um, but you know, in a normal year besides everything that's been going on with COVID and stuff like that, in a normal year, how many weeks out of the year are you and Tom out on the road? You guys both travel together separately? Are your sons with you as well? How does that, how does that work? Um, well, at the, be the beginning, we would used to take our sons all the time um, because they were so small and tiny and it was just easier. And then the, the, the shitty gigs that we were doing, can I say shitty? Oops. You're good. You're good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> this is on a, is this, what kind of platform is this? Is it going to be shown on college or are you going to? This is uh, independent. We are not, I, this show is not affiliated with Central Michigan University. It's not affiliated with it. But if it was, I would have already been fired by now. <laughs> no, so don't worry. Don't worry <laughs> about it. You, I would be, I would be never asked. They, yeah, they would fire me because there, there would be a tweet and then you would not get your diploma. Okay. So this is all good. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I forgot the question. Uh, you guys, when you, in a normal year, how many weeks okay, out of the year you and Tom out? Yes. Travel we work, together um, separately? Yeah, you're like, with you. every, almost like every weekend of the year, like all the time. It's just this ne never a time we're not working and we never celebrate Valentine's Day on the day because we're always working. So we're always celebrating it like on a Monday or a Tuesday <laughs> afternoon. Uh, you know, it's, it's never on the day. We're just so used to that. Uh, we always used to bring, we bring our kids very early on and we would do these shitty gigs. So it's like, if we paid for a babysitter, we wouldn't even make any money. So we would always bring our kids along too. Um, uh, so that's, that, and, and now it's better that we work separate because we headline, we both headline because we'll make the more money that way. So it's, it, it's, it's very few and far between when we work together, but we do like to work together. It's so fun when we get it, like a real big corporate gig that's gonna pay us to, for both of us to come out. And that's real fun. Um, we always say you save on one hotel room, so why not book us together? Yeah, uh, yeah so, um, and we bring our kids along to like those good fun gigs, like on a cruise or something like that. Now they're older and they babysit themselves, which is great. Um, but yeah, we're, we're always working except for now. I haven't worked in like three three months. Been doing zooms like this, but it's nothing like being on stage. Yeah. So being so like being like you said, being on stage when you're performing, do you follow a certain comedy routine, or depending on the audience, do you just go with the flow or just come up with stuff on the fly? Do you play off the audience? 
more than you follow your routine, t take us through your, your routine. Okay, so a little bit of both. I do a little bit of both. I usually have an outline uh, of what I'm going to do. Like if I'm doing like a, um, a country club, I'll have like that sort of say, it's always the same outline, but I'm always like, okay, this is a country club. Make sure you don't do the rape joke. Um, you know, or make sure you substitute the squares to, you know, something else or keep it on the DL. So you kind of sugarcoat a lot of your, your things, but you still have the same uh same kind of routine but then you're also uh you know you need to be professional and you need to switch gears if they're not if they're not going for it you know like oh god they're not going for the the dirty crap i better you know switch gears or if they are going for the dirty crap crap or whatever or the fun crap or if it's like more women i would you know i always get excited when there's more women because then it's like oh i'm gonna do all my parenting stuff in my um girl stuff but if it's like a younger crowd i'm like oh, okay i'm gonna do all the stuff that i that i wrote when i was younger right okay yeah. so you kind of just have a mental kind of note but depending on who you're performing in front of like late night at at the in the city is much different than a country club in long island uh you know the, with a bunch of people that are over 50. you want to be careful with you know you're not going to be you know talking about you want to kind of relate to them but I, I love to play around with the crowd. I love to ask questions and play around and, and kind of riff. And, and some audiences, you can't do that. Some audiences, that they're, they're not going to go for it. So you just go, go oh, like, all right, that's not going to work. So you go right back into your, you know, your regular routine. That, it just all depends on the crowd, the city that you're in, the state you're in. It just all depends on that. So yeah. So, so now, Miss Louise, we're going to do um, a segment that we've done with all of our athletes that have been on this show. It's called Rapid Fire 7. Just seven random questions about you just to get to know you better. Uh, so besides your husband, who's your favorite Wait, favorite comedian? What is seven random questions? Do I just ask one? Do I do one word or just answer it? Just in like one one or two sentences. One or two sentences. Okay. Besides your husband, who's your favorite comedian? George Carlin. George Carlin. Okay. If you could only perform in one city for the rest of your career, what city would it be? Boston. Boston, Massachusetts. Okay. What was your go-to Go to food for you and your family during uh, this pandemic. Eggs, chicken, and chips. <laughs> Favorite place to vacation as a family? Cape Cod and uh, skiing. Just skiing. Uh, okay. North skiing. Movie or TV show you watch the most uh, with your uh, with your family during quarantine? Movie or TV show? Anything you guys binged? Ozark. Me and my husband. Ozark. Ozark. Uh, okay. My boys don't binge. Oh, uh, um, we binged watched kind of together because I I I want to be I want to see where my kids are doing and is uh, Thirteen Reasons Why. Me and my kids. Thirteen okay. Reasons Why. Okay. So me and my husband. Ozark. In in the king, the Fisher King or whatever the chick, the King movie, the cat 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 movie, Carol. Yeah. Carol, what's it called? King Fisher. Tiger King. Tiger King. Tiger King. Yeah, that was a big that was a big thing in the, uh, my household too as well. And a couple of documentaries. My husband liked. We like documentaries. Yes. Would you Would you rather read a book or watch a movie? Watch a movie. Favorite sport to watch on TV. Uh, the Patriots. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> At least you guys have a winning culture up there in Boston. Um, who knows it now? It's a whole different world with Brady gone, so God knows what's going to happen. Brady's a Buccaneer now, so <laughs> yeah, no, uh, us in Detroit are just praying for any type of winning season ever <laughs> out of any team, because it's been a long time since we actually won a championship in any of the four sports. We haven't won a major championship since 2008 when the Red Wings won the Stanley Cup. Well, we tell our, I know, well, we tell our kids, they don't even know how spoiled they are because we're all, we live in New York, but we're all Boston fans. And oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, Cape Cod is another one of the places we love to, to vacation at. Um, some, all my kids are Boston fans and they don't even realize how many, you know, all Boston teams during their age, during their what whole, they've done. Well, yeah, their whole Growing up, like you can't say that they have won 
with the Red Sox, Patriots, the, the Bruins, and the Celtics all have uh, won um, championships throughout their lifetime. They're, and they're, and my, my youngest is 13. Yeah, uh, me growing up here, uh, the Lions, I've only seen the Lions play in two playoff games. They haven't won one since 1992, uh, which was eight years before I was born. Uh, they, the, the Pistons won in 2004, and the Red Wings won in 2008. That's the only titles I've been around for. And my both kids. of them I don't really remember. So right. I'm, I'm just praying. And that you know, I'm looking at my Brady jersey and my Brady poster and stuff like that because I am a Brady fan as well. So I just hope he does good in That's Tampa. Good. They're either Brady fans or Brady haters. There's, ne- there's nothing in between. Well, I am, but I do love Peyton Manning more than Tom Brady. So oh. I've always I been think a he's cuter. Yeah. So, so now going back, going back to you, going back to uh, your co- comedic life. Uh, in 2006, you and your husband had your own uh, TV show on the Women's Entertainment Network called Too Funny. How did you guys get into that? Did you guys write the show, produce it? How did that overall show work? How well, we got that from it? Last Comic Standing. A guy saw us on Last Comic Standing and said, "This is a show." And uh, we uh, went to LA, uh, talked to these guys, got a producer, started filming. And there you go. We did six episodes. It was called Too Funny, TWO. And it was about my twins. I had just given birth to to my twins. Tommy wasn't born yet. And um, it was about bringing them on the road and me and Tom working together as a comedy team. Wow, that's very interesting. It was interesting and it was great because I loved working with them and we were really working together and uh, on stage and because you need to be on stage. You need practice all the time to be on stage and we were getting paid for it. But now we can't really do much together on stage because we're, we're, we're you know, we need to make money. So we have to do the, the big gigs that are going to pay us money. Right. So while, perf- so while performing anywhere, and on any platform has a heckler ever thrown you off your performance in your career uh never have they thrown me maybe for a millisecond but um i usually kind of get them in the end that's how i i work i don't really um establish it right then and there i don't let them make see me sweat and then i pretty much know what i'm going to be saying for the rest of my act and that's when you know i eviscerate them you know like (laughs) Just like in the middle, like I'm about to say, you know, if, if the joke is about um, some loser guy or whatever, I'll say, you know, kind of like you. And I just keep going on and on and on. After all my jokes, you know, if, if I, uh, you know, talk about, you know, if I'm explaining about how ugly something is, again, I'll just say, you know, like you. And it just keeps going on. And then by the end of the night, they're like, geez, I should have never opened my mouth. Right. And then one time I did that to this one girl who heckled me. She was really drunk. And then after the show, I saw her. We're supposed to be fast, right? And I keep talking. So anyway, I saw <laughs> These are funny stories. So I saw her um, passed out all by herself. And she was like this. And she was about to, she was really, really drunk. And if she threw up, she would have died. So I basically saved my heckler's life. I called the mall cop. It was in a mall that I was working at. And so I, and she was like all by herself, gonna pass out, gonna throw, she's almost dying. So I called the mall police. Cause I, I'm like, hi. And I didn't want to know, I didn't want her to recognize me because you probably would have beat me up. So uh, I, I said, where's your friends? And she didn't have any friends. So I called the mall police and saved her life. Wow. After she was telling me I was not funny on stage and she was heckling me. See how it's sometimes it's just, life is just, just so funny like that. <laughs> it's just, wow, that is, that's a heck of a story. Wow, I couldn't even imagine that. Um, so when you're getting ready to perform, it's either, either on TV or on the road. Do you write your own material? Do you have a writing partner? Do you and Tom write for each other and share each other's ideas for each other's acts? Like how does... How does uh, your and your husband's uh, writing process work? Tom steals all my jokes. <laughs> does he? Takes, he takes them. I, you know, no, we do. We, if we fight about anything, we fight about jokes. And I always say, like, if we were to get divorced, like, he can have the house, he can have the kids, but I need my jokes back. 
<laughs> the ones that I gave them. No, uh, we do write together, and sometimes we will actually share jokes. And uh, obviously, because he's a man, he'll get a, a better laugh. And it's like my joke that I wrote. He gets a better, he'll get an applause break on it, and I'll get a, uh, yeah. Because <laughs> just that's how, that's the nature of uh, comedy for some reason. Uh, I like, we do write together sometimes. Um, I like to get a bunch of ideas on paper and then sit down and write, but I don't, I don't sit down and go, okay, what do I want to write about? Uh, but I do with my phone, like if I observe something funny, like I'll, I'll just record it in my phone. And then when I have a bunch of recordings, I'll sit down and start writing. Okay. Yeah. So what, like you said, when you're out performing, like, do you use the same material and routine when you're out on tour, when you're going from city to city, do you just do the same routine just in a different city? Yeah. Like, yeah, but I, I'll change it up a little bit. Like if it's a different. Based, based venue, on where you're at. Yeah. And then, like I said, I like to play around too with the crowd. So it's always different when it's live. So, um, you know, just asking questions or, especially when you have a lot of time on stage, I like to, I like to play around and figure out who they are and meet people and have fun that way as well. Yeah. So, uh, so how often do you and your husband perform together and do you like going just performing by yourself? Do you like performing more with your husband as, you know, as a duo? Like, what do you like doing? It's more? really hard as a duo. Uh, cause we haven't really practiced it's so hard. Cause you gotta be, you gotta kind of figure out where he's going. Uh, so it's in it's uncharted territory for us because we don't have that much practice. Um, but I I love it because it's passion. It's new and it's something great. And if it works, it it works really well. And it's different. That's why I love about it. And we need we need that type of venue, the comedy team, to come back like it was back way back when. So um, I'd like to do more of it. I'm just more scared and I'm not as comfortable. But performing with me up on stage I'm so comfortable people always ask like how do you do it I'm more comfortable on stage than I am you know being a mom with my kids it's like so stressful being at home with all these kids I gotta they want me to feed them they want me to change them they want me to drive them here and there it's like when I'm up when I'm up there on stage just doing my thing you could just rant about your kids on how they just complain about everything yeah, that's, when I'm most, <laughs> that's when I'm most comfortable so how difficult has it been for you, for you and your husband to just, and your, and your three boys, just trying to get through this uh, whole, whole entire pandemic with them being schooled at home and with their current school situation for them going back and you guys, you guys can't, you know, perform, you guys can't perform on stage or go on tour. So how, like, how uh, have you guys been, you know, been going by? It's been tough. It's been very tough. Uh, I have to be honest, it's like depressing at times. Uh, I feel so bad for my kids because they're they're into sports. Their their whole season just got washed away. They're not seniors, so that's a good that, thing. That was good, but they you know, they did miss a few dancers and dances and stuff like that. I really feel bad for all the seniors. And um we were gonna visit all these colleges this summer. That that got canned. Um but each day I get up and you do the best you can because you think of all these stories and you see it on the news that's far worse than what you're going through. So, yeah. I, I, and so I just think about those stories and I think, and I just count my blessings that we're all healthy. And so, and so with having three boys at home and uh, with those boys having both a mom and dad as comedians, do they find your jokes funny at all, or do they just say like, "Okay, that's just that's just another bomb or dad joke that they're just giving us, just giving us to it"? So, yeah, it's absolutely the latter. They think we are so not funny, and I always say, "Well, you're not my audience," and they hate <laughs> when I post something. I hate that they're on my Insta. They're like, "Mom, oh, I even had a text. Uh, I, I I don't have it with me, but the and and, and I." I actually posted their text and got a bunch of likes. They're like, mom, they texted me, uh, not for nothing, but your Insta, that's what they call it. Your Insta was, didn't even have a word. It just gave me the throw up emoji. Your Insta was, Bleh. that's what they wrote. Not for nothing, no offense, but your Insta was, Bleh. your Insta post was, Bleh. so I, I took a picture of it 
and I posted that, got 5,000 likes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's just one way to get back at your kids. Yeah. Um, so when you, were you, so when your husband was on America, on season seven, America's Got Talent, were you always with him, uh, with his auditions all the way to the live shows, to the live finals? Were you guys, were you either backstage with him or were you in the audience with him? Like, tell yeah. us, like, what, would the, what was the America? Uh, America's Got Talent experience like uh, in that particular sense for you just watching him yeah it was it was nerve-wracking because um, you know I, I knew exactly where where he was coming from and where he was going and his how he felt and his nerves and stuff uh, there was sometimes I was backstage most of the time I was in the audience and they had me mic'd up you know too and they had some cameras on me as well and my kids um, and then when it got down to the nitty gritty, it was really tough. He's one of six and I'm one of yep. four. So we had the whole family down from Boston. We're all from Boston, New England, Rhode Island area. So they all wanted to go to the show. So that was very stressful. Here I am trying to get my husband ready, trying to get him not so nervous, but I had a house full of family members. Uh, now that alone can be <laughs> stressful. But great times, good memories, and we had some great celebrations every night when he came home and, uh, you know, got to move on. Oh, believe we had, there, there was bet you thousands of people around the country that were celebrating when he got through, including this, uh, my house as well, um, when, I, when, when we watched him, because he was, my opinion, bet one of the best comedians that show's ever had. He's one of the best comedians that show's ever had, and I, like you said earlier, if you would have made it too, you both would have been probably the best comedians that show's ever had to this point. Well, maybe we'll be together. Maybe we'll get our act together, literally. <laughs> so was it In addition again. <laughs> was it difficult for uh, for the both of you to uh, for raising uh, twin boys? Like, how did you both like adjust your acts and your tours along with raising your your twin boys and eventually your other son? Well, basically, I kind of took the back burner. Like I said, we would do these gigs, and if we had to pay for a babysitter, we wouldn't have made any money. So a lot of these gigs I had to say no to and not just go out and do it just for fun because, you know, I had to take care of these kids. Um, so he did most of the work on the road, and I basically was a single mom a lot, especially early on. He had to work a lot just trying to, you know, pay for these diapers so it was tough I, and we didn't have much family we were all, all like I said all my family's in Boston um so when I did get these really good gigs I would say that for you know calling my mom in to babysit for a week so I would say be able to to say yes I developed um I, I wrote a book uh, during that time and I also developed a web uh, webisode during that time so I was still working and still uh, creating uh, content and my creativity was still flowing because um, I couldn't get out there so that's how I was showing my face you know and, and being out there. Can you tell us more about uh, the content that you were creating uh, like the, can you tell us more about the book and uh, the web series that you uh, created? Yeah, so uh, my book is, um, and he wrote a book too. Uh, my book is called um, Mean Mommy. And it's about, um, it's really, it's about being mean, but being, being good, you know, creating well-behaved kids by telling them, you know, they can't do drugs, they got to do their homework, they got to do their chores, they got to stay in at night, you know, that type of stuff. But, um, but it's all about my life. It's really funny, long stories. And that's how I do my routine. Um, but Tom, you know, he's a one liner guy. So this is called bad dad. Just bad dad. And bad dad. So it's mean mommy and bad dad. My kids are going to be needing therapy soon. Uh, so uh, yeah, look at him at the back. That's the back him. Uh, Throwing a baby, and that's my back. Just Me, and my yes. kids. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, it's just this is again about my stories. This is all one liners. You put this by the toilet, and you'll have a blast. Uh, you know, this is just like what quick, quick read one liner. And you can buy these on Amazon, by the way. Um, and, uh, and I also, I just recently wrote this other book. My son has an allergy. Um, so, I wrote Harry the Elephant Has an Allergy. And um, it's a, it's just a funny little story that, uh, you know, starts the di dialogue of um, kids with allergies. So it's, 
so it's, they're not so scared. And there's my kid. Oh, oh, how awesome. How awesome. Is that on Amazon as well? This is also on Amazon, yeah. Yeah, Excellent. and it's a children's book. Oh, my, so, my, my uh, yeah, on I know Amazon. I this show. Yeah, um, yeah, you could link it, link all the uh, all the these books. Absolutely. Um, and all the proceeds to this one actually goes to my kids' mouths. So, <laughs> they, they, you know, I'm unemployed. I I have two kids at the same time going to college. So please help. Um, I, and I started a, a. I did 100. I just finished my 100th, 100th episode uh, for after nine years of mummy minutes. I call them mummy minutes. And they're just little minutes of fun and what, you know, it's usually about if it's a, it's a, it's about whatever happened that month. So I would do one once a month. And like, there's a lot of Christmas videos if, uh, around the time or summer, or it's just funny stories of what actually happened with my kids. And then I would reenact it with them. Wow. That that is that is all fantastic. Um, so, and even uh, even even all the you know the books and the guy could, like again we'll link all the books uh, so you can for uh, Amazon and all that so you can go out and buy. I know I will because I definitely want to read read me mommy. I do that. That sounds like a really good book and especially oh that's great birth control for you. Uh, <laughs> and especially I uh, told me you're like I will never have kids. I can't believe what you went through. Uh, it's uh, good birth control. So, and fi finally, uh, I can never remember a joke or a punchline. Uh, is there any way you could tell me, tell me one joke, one joke to end on a funny note? Um, like a joke book joke? Or I, one of my jokes? Either or, either or. I'm content. I, you know, it's so funny that you say you can't remember a joke. Neither can I. I'm a, I'm a stand-up comic. I do that for a living, but I can't tell a joke to save my life. I can't remember jokes, uh, but I can remember my own act. But although I haven't done it in so long, so I don't even know. But um, okay, so I posted today. This is not even a joke. This is not even like a ha-ha joke, but I posted a joke. Um, and my kids are like, mom, that's not funny. And the, but I think it's funny. It's not funny, but it's so here was my post today. Um, it's hard enough I have to match my outfit with my shoes. Now I have to match my mask. Oh, yeah. No, I I, I completely agree because, you know, it's going out. It's not only that, you know, for us, all, us guys, we have some of us, we don't care what we if we match or not. So, you know, being young, you care if you match. And now you, you know. Yeah, you it's another accessory. Shirt. I need another accessory that I have to worry about. Bait or you know, wearing a blue shirt and I put on a maroon mask, it's like, okay, this doesn't match at all. I need to find something that matches. Uh, I don't have a blue mask, I need to go out and waste twelve dollars on a blue mask. Yeah, you need a designer mask because a designer mask matches everything. <laughs> Just yeah, and that's where they like, like Louis Vuitton leather mask. And that will go with everything. A leather, a leather mask. Yeah, that is, or just even just throw on, just throw on just a helmet, just like a cut, like a costume helmet, just walk around something, something like that. Right. So and for me, my mask will hide all my wrinkles, uh, which is nice. And my resting bitch face, which, which is another good thing that it hides. But yet um, you, you usually, I usually pass out on smelling my own breath. So there's that. Yeah, that just they try and solve one problem and get all these other problems. Again. But you don't need as much, so that's good. So, the pros and cons of the COVID mask. So and and Miss Louise, that's all. That's all I have for you. Thank you so much for coming on uh, with us tonight. Uh, and especially, especially nice to see uh, see your husband Tom right before he took the dog out for a walk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like we said, like I said, we're going to link uh, both your book, your husband's book, both your books and your husband's book on with this, uh, with this post. So, and again, uh, please buy uh, uh, the uh, elephant book because again, all the pro proceeds go to uh, her kids feeding mouths. So, and that's, uh, that's really important in this day and age, in this time. So <laughs> yeah, you guys feed yeah, the You clip. also can um, uh, download um, my YouTube page, uh, but if you, if you do, do the link to the last, the very last episode that shows what I did was um, I made my kids watch the very first episode when they were ten, nine years earlier. Oh, right. <laughs> And they were like, almost didn't recognize themselves. They're like, oh my God, I was that tiny. And um, then I did all the, the, uh, the highlights of all the nine years of Mommy Minutes. 
Wow. So you, get, you can share that link too. I can send you all those links later. But you can find them because you're a kid and you are very good at that techie stuff. Um, I mean, with doing a show like this, you kind of have to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, thank thank you so thank you so much, Miss Louise. We we greatly appreciate. It. Hopefully, we can have your hu husband on and maybe you guys together on someday. Uh, that would be that'd be so much fun. Um, so, thank you so much again, and uh, good luck with everything. And uh, we hope to uh, ha hope to have you guys both back on soon. You too. Thank you so much for having me and good luck with you and everything. Thank you so much. Keep in touch. Will do.